Thank you very much. I hope I'm audible. Uh, with this column mic, I like moving around. So I requested for the column mic here. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so the topic, uh, when Vikram had, in fact, uh, when Sam had invited me, they wanted to talk about. This is a talk that I've given a few weeks back, also at a different forum. Uh, but I think the relevance of this talk topic is independent of forum. It's forum agnostic. It's very much which concerns you, me, everybody who's uh, working to create value. It concerns Swiggy as much as SoftBank, as much as Raymond, as much as any of the FMCG durable companies that you really work for. And, and I'm, I'm calling this entire talk self-disrupt self or perish, and not disrupt or perish. And there is reason why I have added a prefix to disrupt saying self-disrupt because I increasingly believe that it's becoming an inevitability rather than waiting for looking at, at a trend like a swiggy to happen to restaurant industry, a food industry, uh, or an equivalent of what we are seeing in auto, aviation, hotel industries. I think time has come that uh, rather than hoping that somebody will come and give us an insight, it's important for legacy organizations like ours for sure, where I work for, or a lot of our uh, established corporations that Manoj spoke about will get disrupted to self-disrupt and really not wait. And that's the reason I add self. But before I really talk about that, I want to talk about perish because in our existing mental model, if we see that if we don't self-disrupt, and we will perish, but if we see perish by our existing mental model, it will mean that we'll perish because we are either incompetent or not relatively as competent as a new player, or we don't have the right competitive advantage in our product, brand, customer experience, any of those things, or we don't have the size, we don't have scale, we don't have digital, and that's the reason we should perish. If we think perish with that limited myopic way, we will be wrong because we could perish for reasons that are totally and completely out of our control. You may have the best brand, best size, market leadership, any scale, best digital, best platform, best business model, and yet we can fail, we can perish. And that's the reason I decided that let's first spend the first quarter of our talk really to understand what perish really is meaning in the current contextual terms. Because if we miss that part, the disruption will not really, really be understood in the way you know, we should really look at this entire lens. And that's why first perish and then really go into self-disrupt there. And I'm going to take some examples that you would have heard in many forums. You would have talked, you would have studied about these, you would have learned about it. Many forums would have dealt at depth about these problems as to why some of these brands really fail there. But my reason of using some of these examples, which are very, very popular examples, is more or less not about what went wrong, but about the definition of what could go possibly wrong. And do you really, do we as community really understand what could possibly go wrong? First example is very <coughs> common example. All of us have used these brands in our lifetimes, not very long back. This was the market leading brand in the world. Almost in every country it operated and was responsible for two out of three decades of giving mobility to this entire world, which is Nokia. I don't know how many people really know Nokia was the pioneer which really set the ball rolling for what is today wireless technology. The terms like T9 dictionary, if you were 20 years back, or GSM, which is even today talked about global standards of mobility is what GSM is. All these terms were coined invented, patented, coined, and given to the world by this company called Nokia, which doesn't exist today in the, in the way it really started. This is a November 2007 cover of Forbes magazine. And here is the CEO at that point of time called Oli Pekka of Nokia, the global CEO. And the cover really reads, you can read it there, it's saying one billion customers, and that time there were about one, two and a half billion customers. Nokia had about 40% market share. And the cover goes on to say, can anyone take on the cell phone king? So 2007, and it is not that Apple was not born then. Touch technology was there. iPhone was launched in May 2007. The first iPhone was launched in May 2007. Seems like a long time back. And this is six months after iPhone coming into the market and becoming the rage it is, there is a whole analysis, design, research done in a global magazine saying, yes, there is an iPhone, but 
you know, Nokia is Nokia. And this is September 2012. This is the CEO, Stephen Elop. Uh, and it says this company got bought by Microsoft and really collapsed in no time, but just less than five years from there. You know, companies do come and go. This, these brands do come and go. <clears throat> And Nokia, kind of a brand with 85% share in India, 40-45% global share, more than 50% share of operating software, which is Symbian, which is what they used to work on. And iOS was not even born at that point of time. And with the kind of momentum and innovation pipeline, it is very difficult to imagine a company which was thinking 10-15 years ahead of time with that level of brand strength, stickiness of the model, premium, that customers were ready to pay would have a destruction of over 95% of enterprise value in less than four or five years. Now one can say it's technology, technologies come and go, but I don't think it was a failure of technology. I was working for Nokia from 2004, five, that, that, that kind of, a, that, that, that's the era that I was working for them and I was in Finland. I recall seeing the innovation pipeline which was about 10 years ahead of time, and one of, some of the most exciting phones that you could lay your hands on. Things like they were looking at very advanced multimedia phones, they were looking at bracelets which were becoming phones, the ear popping rings, very small things, penetrables which were phones, all those things that we talked about. They had a very exciting lineup of technology. So what goes wrong here? There is a technology assessment matrix that every single tech company in the world uses to know what is their competitive strength. And that's Gartner. It's called a magic quadrant. And magic quadrant has this two by two, if you're on the top right, would mean that every investor would bet on you any amount of funding you can get, and you are right there, which is secure position, which is called a star position in a magic quadrant. Nokia for 15 years consistently has been on the right hand because of the innovation pipeline, the quality, the, the bets that the world was taking on this company. And that company goes bankrupt. And the funny thing is not that. The, the, the really amazing thing what amuses me is this quote. This is the quote by the CEO after it was bought. And he said, we did not do anything wrong, but somehow we lost. And that's, that's a moving statement. That tells you that you have the best brand, the best people, best army, all of us. Kind of, if you, have a, uh, if you were a brand head of a Nokia, if you're a media company of a Nokia, if you're the creative partner of a Nokia, any vendor of a Nokia, you would really give a right arm for that because it was one of the best companies you're working for. And that team really reflects back and says, we don't really understand what went wrong. So there is something about the change that if we pick up on the right time, maybe we can get it right. And it's not just one example. Now I'm going to run a little fast on the other two examples. This is Kodak. All of us know the story of Kodak. But this is the man who invented digital photography in the world. His name is Steve Sasson. He is the head of R&D of Kodak. Kodak is a company which was 150 years market leader out of the 160 it existed in the world. Uh, it invented photography in the world, like Nokia invented mobility. So pretty much generic to photography. We all know what Kodak moment really is. This is in 1977, I think, when the first digital camera was patented by Kodak. And Steve Sasson did it. It's a patent in his name. It's a funny story where his daughter wanted to see the photographs of her birthday, just five year old on the day of the birthday and he said, no, it'll take us one week to get you the real pictures because it goes for processing and all that stuff, it takes you one and she started crying and he felt really bad. So he invented Polaroid, which gave instant photography and then went on to create a digital camera. And from 75 till 92, every single board meeting of Kodak, this was presented as an alternative innovation to what is the chemicals, the roles, the selling of the films, the processing of the films as instant photography. And every single bone meeting to the extent which is documented, and I'm sure people who really read this know that, it's documented that Steve was told not to talk about it. They said, it's cute technology, but don't tell anybody about it. Why? Because it challenged every single thing Kodak stood for, the economic model of Kodak. 99.9% .9 revenues come from those films and the roles and the processing. So it's virtually saying that, okay, I have an innovation which will make you completely vanish, which will make you extinct from the world. Now, could you as a company take that economic call 
that whole business call of saying that everything I know, do, all my company, all my infrastructure is going to go away in the next five years because of this innovation there. There's no economic model. We don't even know how to make money there. And that's what happens if you don't disrupt ourselves and something else comes from outside. So you can hide. You can tell that, don't tell anybody about it, but if, sooner or later people will figure it out and, and you will really go from 160 years of market leadership in the next seven years from, from there to zero. And it's global market ship. These are top companies in the world. Third company I talk about quickly before I move on there is a content king of America. Used to be, erstwhile. It's a company called Blockbuster and it used to control virtually every content in America, whether it's uh, Paramount to Universal to 20th Century Fox to uh, digital to cable to television. It, it, it was a content aggregator company and you have to pass through them if you have to really. This was a key intermediary there. I, I recall myself being launching a direct-to-home satellite platform in India at that point of time in 2007. I wanted an appointment from him. I was traveling to US and it, it, it just was hitting a brick wall because this man was just too busy. He was, he was the content king of America, so you couldn't really get that. At somewhere around that in 2008, Netflix was very early days of Netflix and some of the you know, streaming services had started. And there was a magazine which interviewed him in which he made this quote, wherein he said that neither Redbox nor Netflix are even in the radar screen of competition. They're not even the radar screen. And look at the speed at which things can go wrong. Now, you, you even know who's there, and you say, no, I don't even bother about that. And then in one year, this is December 2009, you go bankrupt. You're a CEO of the largest content producing country, the biggest industry that happens. And you say, I don't even think they are in a radar screen. And in one year, you go bankrupt because of the same competition that you didn't, was not in the radar screen there. Now, is it lack of competence? Is it lack of capability? Is it lack of research? Is it lack of brand equity? Is it lack of size, scale, age, knowledge base, best people working for you? No, you have everything at your disposal. And still, there could be an error in, in, in judging the whole business case there. So it's like I slept perfectly with the mosquito net, Odomos, everything, and still one mosquito came, bit me, and next day morning, I was dead. I never woke up. Yeah. How can you be so ignorant? Or uh, were you really ignorant? Is it a human, is it a competence issue or something which is beyond this? And it's not just that. People who disrupt, this is Netflix, 10 years of market leadership. And in no time, here comes Apple TV, Disney, two months back in the world, and the whole value gets destroyed. So yes, you can have a right. And then in no time, that also goes away. So what's happening in this world? Where are we living? What kind of brand competitiveness we are investing in, advertising sales, one year forecasts. We're living in this world, we're making future bets. And these things are happening to the best of the brands there. So there must be something deeper that we must reflect upon as a team. And it, one could argue, they're all technology brands, but is it technology? This Baba has no technology to talk about. He's disrupted every single multinational in this country, went back, again is now servicing again to disrupt and probably the Baba.2.0, Patanjali.2.0 will happen. So this, this, we talked about Swiggy, talk, what about auto? Talk about this, what's happening in auto industry? Industry after industry, things are happening. We really, I have seen from, and you all, all have observed in the last one year since the auto slowed down, every possible insight has been thrown by every champion of the industry. Somebody says it's because of shared cap. Uber and Ola, the industry is falling. Somebody says BS6 standard. Somebody says, no, no, generally slow down here because uh, discretionary income has gone. People are deferring their purchases. So it's an economic slowdown. Is it BS4 standard? Is it electrical auto happening? Is it this happening? Or all of them coming together? It's a compounding impact. Now, if as a champion of the industry, if you're looking at taking this industry to growth, well, how will you take a decision? What's the right reason? So what's going on? Leaders for decades are just going away and people who were born yesterday are becoming leaders, global brands, Indian brands. So what does age mean of a brand? When you can, 150 of years of leadership can go away in one or two years. Size, reputation, current sales, brand equity, IP, technology, people, everything can be bottled. 
everything and be hired. Despite buying everything, you can just lose out. So it, none of this guarantees our existence tomorrow. And I'm going to come back a little later about things like Corona. It just got off a call in the afternoon today with the head of Cathay Pacific in India. There are horror stories as to what's happening. Because I wanted to, because we, uh, we are dependent on China for our shipments. So there are cargoes stuck there. And for something that is completely out of your control, you'll have to now worry about the whole global supply chain really getting disrupted. Yeah, and I'm going to talk about it a little later. But look at this. So the point I was making is Sony Walkman disrupted every possible two-in-one uh, in 80s. As we all know, 80s, that was the thing. Uh, and then themselves got disrupted by digital music. So constantly, one has to be on the wheel of thinking, what is the next big thing? It's not the product. It's not product innovation. There has to be business model. No, it's just not the business model. There's a technology. Maybe not. Maybe something else is also coming in there. So it's a very different kind of a chain that we are seeing. And we must understand what's happening. And I'm going to talk about it. Because we are living in the age where a billion dollar valuation gets made in, in, in actually days now, not even months. And uh, earlier, it used to be the average company used to make a billion dollar in 2000, 2005, if you see only 15 years back, it used to take a good company would be, take about 13 years. If you take the top S&P 500 companies in the world, they would take a billion dollars. The best companies would do it in 13 years. All these companies, Snapchat, Airbnb, WhatsApp, have done it under two years. There's a company which is an electric car company called Bird. I don't know how many of you heard. Has done it in five months. There was Pokemon Go, which game got launched about two years. It did $4 billion valuation in four weeks, billion dollar a week. Raymond did billion dollars in 92 years. And we celebrated with a champagne and a cake. And people are doing it in a week now. Yeah. So you can understand which world are we living in. We should celebrate it because it's a big thing to be a billion dollar valuation company. And people are just doing this. Look at Swiggy. I don't know how many billion dollars would Vivek's company is. I think maybe 10, 15, 20 billion dollars. So there are there is an economic imperative that is happening, and we must understand where the change is really going there. Yeah? Look at all these companies. They've disrupted completely the industry. So what's really happening, and then I'll come to how do we really embrace this perishable thing. One other thing that is to be really understood, if only one thing you take about perish is really this. Our mental models, our organizations have been geared up for a linear change. We are brilliant at linear change. We understand, we get educated to trained to execute linear change models. So tell us that, okay, this year is 10% growth, let's grow by 30%. We know how to do it. We know exactly how to do it. This is the kind of additional resource I need. I need more share of voice. I need better awareness. I need additional advertising investment. I need more infrastructure. Let's say Raymond does 1 million or 4 million jackets a year, which is what we're doing right now. And I looked at the number who's the highest jacket maker in the world is 7 million. So, Somebody said, why can't you be the largest jacket maker or suit maker in the world? So linear mental model will tell you, okay, four million and five factory, teen factory or chahiye, ek ek million ki at least for me to reach from four to seven. That's what I need to do. So let's set up infrastructure. Let's invest in plants. Let's create more factories in the cheapest locations. So the mind works like that. So we're very good at that. So if you tell that, okay, there is a X kind of a growth, X kind of a RO, return on investment. That's how you get rewarded. All of us get uh, all performance management system, whole logic really works on that. But the moment we get into compounding logic, which is the way change is happening right now, human cognitive sense is not able to grab it. It, it, it totally goes. It's like saying that if I have to take 30 steps, and I take this example every time because it's easy to comprehend, from here and I walk towards you, and I just take 30 steps, one, two, three, four, 30 linear steps towards you, 95% of people in this room would be 95% probability right that where I would be at the end. Maybe I'll be towards the end of the room, maybe just three-fourth of the room is what my typical step would take me to. But if I change this whole premise to saying I take 30 double steps and not linear steps, the first step is one, the second is two, the third is four, so one, two, four, eight, and if I ask the question, where would I be at the end of 30 double steps, 99.9% people, in fact, 100% people are likely to get it wrong. Because human mind cannot work the compounding logic. And just the answer is that I would have traveled 26 times across the world in 30 double steps. Yeah, 30 single steps takes me there, 30 double steps, 26 times across the world. Which means the 31st double time, 
double step would be 52 times across the world. That's what it really means. And that's the pace with which the change is happening. And there is something about that. And this is industry after industry. What is happening is the moment we're putting information technology into the proposition of any industry, the rate of change doubles every 9 to 12 months. And that's the whole conundrum about compounding logic, which we are unable to grasp. And that totally changes the auto industry. All the dots start joining together. Any industry we take, hotel, auto, aviation, voice, data, content, that's what it's the pace of change is doubling every 9 to 12 months. And we're just not able to grasp how quickly things can just go wrong. So a lot of predictions that Manoj was saying will take five years. I think it will take probably, some of them will take probably two years, maybe one year. Similarly, what Sam was talking about digital. I think the journey from 23 to 50 percent for digital in India will happen in the next three years, not in the next 10 years, or maybe two and a half years. That's the doubling pattern that we will really observe. And the, why the mind really misses it out? Why does the mind misses it out? Because every single industry which gets digitized goes through these phases necessarily. Three phases in sequence and three phases almost parallelly will happen. Almost every single thing in the world will get digitized in our lifetimes. That's the given. Everything yeah, from this clothes to headphones to music to data, already half the things are. If you see voice is digitized, music is digitized, content is digitized, half the things are. Look at what your phone is carrying today. Uh, the amount of 20 specific applications were all physical separate things about 10 years back. Everything has got digitized. Every single thing in the world will get digitized. Water will get digitized, air will get, everything will get digitized. And anything which gets digitized is very deceptive because it looks ugly to start with. It looks big, that digital camera. And it's slow because the first step, linear step, is only 0.01. It's the first 3D manufacturing machine made in 1975. It will take time. And then the second step from 0.001 becomes 0 0.002, 0 0.004. And by then, yours and my career are over when it reaches one because it's 30 years. So we tend to ignore it. But the moment it touches one, one to 100 happens in the next five years. One, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64. And then it just starts galloping. And that's where it gets you into a very. So every digital technology is very deceptive, very deceptive to start with. And that's where we don't know, should we, shouldn't we? Should we bet on it? Time. Now, 3D manufacturing, who will print 3D clothes? Who will print 3D clothes? But then, if with the price performance doubling, if you can put it in back in your business, then pretty much you can come to an accurate forecast within 5 or 10 years or even lesser horizon. Because once it gets there, it gets disruptive. How can a country which had less than 5% teledensity 15 years back be almost 100% teledensity today? It is not linear, it's compounding. And the moment it gets disruptive, because it is digital, it gets demat every single thing gets dematerialized. So, so, the product is dematerialized. It's not a two-in-one, it's not a streaming service. It's not a television, it's not an injectable app. Uh, my sense is that in the next five, seven, at best, ten years, every single screen that we are currently interfacing with will be dematerialized. So, there won't be any screens in our life. Everything will come into some other form of neocortex. Somewhere they will inject or there will be things the way screens will just disappear from our life, but still we'll see everything we want to see. Yeah? So that, that's what is going to happen. And once it gets demilitarized, there's no cost, because physically not. The physical cost is not. Demonetized. In the positive sense of demonetization. Yeah? It just is not, because there is no cost to it. Everything has to become free. So voice, which used to be such an expensive proposition where incoming also used to pay, and I think we have already come to a time where you will get paid to speak more. It will be the other way around, because you have to burn that, yeah, that whole digital economy. And the moment it gets demonetized, it gets democratized. Everybody uses it, because it's free. It's not too far away that everything in the world that you and I consume today, or 70-80% of things we consume physically today, will be free to consume in 10 years from now. Yeah? There won't be any shortage of any of these things that we talk about. Now, I'm not saying that world will not have, world will have more water, more health, more food, more environmental, more energy than you, you and I can imagine. It's a given. Because everything will get digital. Yeah, we're already talking about people are winning elections on 24-hour electricity. I think it's passe. 
Think about an example in Germany, which is just two years back in Christmas, where the government said, if before you go to Christmas leave, please switch on all the lights of your house, switch on your television, keep everything on, because when you come back, you have a surprise dollar check waiting for you or euro check waiting for you. Because they had so much of energy that the cost of storing that energy was more than cost of burning it. That's the word. So you're going to get paid to use that. The next promise, probably Modi will make that batti jalao or paisa pao. Because that's the, that's the power. Every single resource in the world, hydro, coal, anything you think about, wind, all this, every single natural resource in the world from where you can make energy, if you put together the whole planet, is less than five days of solar. Five days of solar, if full capture kar liya, artne, is more energy than every single source that you and I know. Oil, coal, ye, everything put together. It's a matter of time that we'll get to that ability. And we say 25 years is what scientists predict. So 25 years from now, a lot of you will be 45, 50. So five days of capture, we will not know how many planets to light up. And what do we do with so much of energy? Oil economy is going to run out in less than 10 years. Stone age ended not because stone ran out. Oil will end not because oil will run out. Oil will be there, but oil economy will run out. It's a matter of time there. Every single thing will be there. The, the, the problem that we need to see as statesmen is, are we going to be able to get the polarization which is happening in incomes to consume wealth, uh, whether it's going to be a have-nots and haves, or whether it's going to be haves and super-haves. That's going to be the real conundrum for the political. Now this is, imagine my plight as a CEO of a company which sees this. It's a Bloomberg article uh, which comes and says death of clothing. <laughs> so you, you're talking about a company which only has 13 manufacturing plants, which I uh, oversee in my with my teams there. I have 35,000 people who really work in those plants day in, day out. They work for their lifetime and they churn out so much of cloth. And then imagine this article comes and saying death of clothing. Yes, obviously it's a very worrisome thing and saying, okay, is this also going to get digitized at some point of time? And I actually believe it is. It's a matter of time. This is a digital dress which was launched in US last year. It's not very long far back. It obviously is like a Steve Sasson camera. It takes time. Very deceptive. It looks very cumbersome, but here is a naked lady or just in, she's, not, she's just wearing a digital skin. There's no fabric on her body. It could, I would not be surprised that this is the 14th pitch Madison in 20th, 90% of us are wearing digital skin hair. Nobody has a fabric on their body. And then you decide what is the fashion in the room, we change by the session module. Okay, I like yellow color, okay, here's a speaker likes yellow, let's all turn to yellow. He likes yellow. So we just remote control it and all of you turn to yellow. Or you say, okay, I got a tattoo yesterday, show me, you just do this and this, and this is a tattoo, and then it goes back. So it, it gives so much of options there. This is a reality. This digital dress is already there. It's about 10,000 pounds today or euros today. Apparently, if I do the price performance doubling ratio, in about five, seven years, it'll be less than $100. So you can walk into a store or just don download online mobile and say, today I want to wear this dress digitally and the digital skin takes you over and you decide the design, look at the flexibility. You, you can never be wrongly dressed. You can never be wrongly dressed. You can go to any party and decide, oh, this was a theme, fine, let me do that. Just change the app and that's about it. This is gonna happen. So market power velocity is being decided by, so if we are in the business, if for creating demand, you're spending more money, we are in the wrong business. Yeah, marginal cost of supply and marginal cost of demand has to come down every single year by digitization. And if you're not able to do that, I don't think we are really creating big brands, and I think Swiggy was a great example. I just loved the way Vivek set it up in, in a very short time. Now, very quickly on self-disrupt. So what can we do in this environment? If that is what is perishing, if my brand strength doesn't stand for anything, my spends, my advertising, my media, my distribution, if all of that can get disrupted, how do I really work? What do we really do? So these are just some views. Obviously, there's no right or wrong because we have to really get into that, but a few views that I wanted to share very quickly and then I'll just end my talk. There are just three vectors on which I would like to engage with you. The first one is, I think it's been said enough, but never has been a more important time for us to embrace this, is to say, envision the purpose why we are there, not the business model why we are there, not the products, the purpose why we are there. And I'll just give you a couple of examples to enamorate that. 
we are living in a world where everything changes. You wake up to a world which is a new world every single day. Time is getting compressed. We already know about geopolitics, climate issues. I don't want to get into that, but disruptive startups, via networks. They're talking about horizontal organization, digital sharing world. All of us know that. Probably five years back, none of these faces would have made it even to a magazine. Forget about the global cover of the magazine. Yeah. Uh, corona at the center is, is obviously changing the whole world right now. It's just like uh, somebody was telling me just in the morning today when I was talking, that the largest pharmaceutical companies we thought would be rejoicing because there is a, this is a pandemic right now is good for some industries. Like war is a good commerce for some industries. Health is also a good commerce for pharma. So talking to somebody and he said, actually, you know what? 70% of bulk which goes into making medicines for India pharma industry comes from China. And they have less than one week of stock. There's a whole disruption which has happened. So there is a pharmaceutical industry reeling under stress right now. They should actually be saying, oh, everybody's coughing, this, there is threat, preventive medicine. Here comes a big opportunity. My chairman asked me last one week, he's been pondering, he's saying, oh, God, China is closed. China is 40% of global trade of textile. What about our factories? Let's flush them out. Let's work three shifts fully. Let's get orders. Because last five weeks, China has not dispatched a single container on textile. Because three weeks anyway, Chinese New Year, and after that, two weeks now. And yes, today morning, we got to know it's still 20th February. They have deferred every manufacturing. And when I was speaking in the morning to some Chinese counterpart, they're saying end May, early June is the earliest you expect things to start coming back to normal. Four months, 18% of global GDP, 40% of traded GDP comes to a halt. What happens to the, I'm saying there's no way we can come out of this 6% is, would be a marvelous achievement for Indian economy if it reaches that. My sense is it will be flat to decline now. So how do you really brave up to this world? Look at this, I'm mean, just take look at Iran, what happened there? Is nuclear warfare there? Is bio warfare there? Uh, floods? Look at the kind of fire in Australia. Can't even control. We have the best technology in the world. Very advanced stages. We do 21st century. We can't put off a fire in a forest. And it just goes on and on and on and on. And, and so many animals die. So many species go extinct. Something is happening in this world that we need to just get the pulse off. The first time the person of the year is not a person, two years back, but a movement called hashtag me too. And not only that, a year after that person of the year is actually a 17 year old kid who does a hunger strike outside sitting on a school and saying, I don't want to go to school. What's the point? Because I'm going to die because of environment. And she goes on to actually become a nominee for Nobel Peace Prize, which I believe it was good that it was given to somebody else. But having said that, I may have a different perspective, but maybe she was a deserved nominee and goes on anyway to become the person of the year in terms of times cover. So it's a very different world that we're living in today. So what is this purpose I'm talking about? The purpose I talk about is, is really just think about now the same board meeting I talked about Kodak, 1991. They said, come on, Steve, our business is all this. We, we make money out of this. This is all the eco revenue, profitability, skill level, people, 10,000 labs. It's like Starbucks, ko coffee will not give so why do they Because coffee beans are spent, there are farmers, hai, vendors, hai, shops, hai, retail staff. No, but two years later, people will not give coffee, bina denge, so they will do something else. Look at that dilemma that the business and management team is going to have. Now, what does the purpose mean for Kodak? Kodak thought they were in the business of this, where now looking hindsight, the business of Kodak was to preserve moments, that's all. What does photography mean? That you just preserve that moment, which you don't want to let go because you want to see it later. You want to refer to that moment later, so you just preserve it in your camera. Now think of the business meeting and saying we as a team, Kodak, are in the business of preserving moment. That's what we have done from 1831 when photography was invented in the world. Till date, we've only preserved moment. Forget about the me method of doing it. How does it matter? Camera cilia, digital cilia, Polaroid cilia, Insta cilia, kya fark pat? But our business is and we'll figure out how to make money out of that. But they thought this is their purpose, but actually the purpose was that, so you go wrong. So we need to understand for our brand, what is the purpose? If the purpose is to make you look beautiful, grooming, then how does it matter whether it's application of a cream, injectable, digital, looking, standing in front of us, some mirror and that making you beautiful should not matter. But we make that matter far more than the real purpose there. So that's one example. And it's not important that we get the purpose right and we get it always right. We can have the purpose right, like Nokia. Nokia's purpose is beautiful. I think it was always, 
was very proud of this line when I was there and I, I, I could see that. The purpose was connecting people. That's all matters. It doesn't really matter whether we need to do it through multimedia phones or we need to do touch screen or we need to do QWERTY keyboards. How does it matter? And then you get stuck because you think your purpose is this. So you can have the statement right or the philosophy right, but execution wrong. Their execution was wrong. This, so, so it could be either way. That's the important thing to understand. So we at Raymond started actually really introspecting, saying what is our purpose, and we are trying to architect now. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples before I, on Raymond so we understand where we're going. So we, so we need to really understand from our purpose and really move into this from left to right, your left to right. And there is where you said, only two questions to be answered for every brand. Who are we? And why do we exist? Who are we? We are a company called whatever, brand, which is into capturing moments. Why do we exist? To preserve those moments. That's why we exist. That's Kodak. There's nothing else. And as long as that is there, how does it matter? Whichever platform does it. So we tried to do it for Raymond and we did not perfected it, but we're getting there. We said, okay, the stage currently we are, we are a, com we are a company which gives you wardrobe solution, menswear, menswear, wardrobe solution, jackets, suit, shirts, belts. That's what we are. And why do we exist? To make you look good. Otherwise, why do you buy us? Because when you pick up that stuff from wardrobe and you wear it, you look confident, you look good. So that's why we exist. And from there, maybe it needs to evolve to a little more, from a functional to a little more experiential. So we will be, why do, uh, we, we, we are a lifestyle experience company who wants to make you to feel good and not just look good. So that's kind of our purpose there. The second point I want to make is, this is the first thing, all the brands must do that is my view. Second, digitize value chain. You have, it's an existential thing. It's no more digital in business is gone. Digital is business. Every single thing will get digitized. Your supply chains, your products, your sourcing, your, your work frame, your work, everything is going to get digitized. And, and, and it's important to really understand what kind of impact it could happen. And how do you do that? Very simple, I'm coming to the 6D model. Pick up every node of the value chain that you work for and put digital in everything, theoretically, then see what could happen. Everything can get really disruptive and destroyed. So that's how really you do that. And there are many, many, many technologies that can change the whole trajectory there. Yeah? This is just a very brief part of the textile value chain in which these are the emerging technology and digital platforms which have started impacting every global company in the world. And I'm not talking about all of them, but let me give you some example, two or three of them, which in Raymond, we have started working and how it can totally change the way all of us clothe ourselves. We are also doing it. We know there are many other people outside this room are doing it. There are many of our competitors are doing it. So everybody is into it. Now, whosoever gets it fast and right will, will really be the winner. Now, let me give you one example just to bring on the point how this could completely change the conventional mindset. We're making accessories. Yeah, This is like the cufflings and uh, tie pins and those kind of lapel pins, all these things we make. And we're looking at, uh, can a 3D printer make it? So we just put a design and it comes chucked. We just put the whatever is the editive and raw material and it comes whichever design I put in the software, can it come? And we started working on this about two years back with some of the 3D manufacturers. And today we have it commercial. Raymond has launched it commercially. Now a typical 3D accessory, if I have to go, and let's say I have to buy 1,000 tie pins, 10,000 this, and it takes about 75 days prior order because conventional thing about any metal thing is injection molding. So you make a task and you put that thing and you keep the mold. Then once the mold is ready, you can make as many. And the mold itself takes 30 to 60 days and then the production time from China and then the shipment time to India. If you take, so if I have to plan, let's say for New Year's or Valentine's Day, yeah, I have to say, okay, I need to give these beautiful rose fled lapels or bracelets, uh, or whatever I have to decide, I should have decided in the conventional supply chain about a Valentine's Day commerce opportunity seven, six months in advance. Yeah? And then everything would have fallen in place and I would have done distribution, I would have perfect. With 3D printed, you can just decide 10 days before. Because nothing is required. Everything is digitized. Yeah? You just buy the raw material, put it in there, and you don't need a minimum order quantity. You can make one. You don't need a mold. So when I'm now in Raymond, when I go to a music concert, I wear a music lapel. When I go to a sports concert, I play the sports one. And when I'm going to aviation event, I can wear an aeroplane there. And it's just one made only for me. And it's cheaper than because all the dematerialized cost is gone. So physicality, stocking, inventory, interest on inventory, shipment, everything is gone. It's far cheaper. 
So you buy that brilliant lapel pin, 10,000 rupees, you get a 3D printed, customized to your name. We have requests coming from couples, young couples who are coming there and saying, I want to do a bracelet gift to my boyfriend or fiance, which is matching with the wavelength of the birth time that he was born. What was the ecological wavelength? So we used to, we can extract that on a software and we can convert that design and make that bracelet. And that's a very, you know, kind of an intimate kind of a gift or a very passionate gift to be given to somebody. So these kind of requests have started coming. They're really crazy. And you can charge any amount of premium for these things because you just make one and you can charge a huge premium for that. You can deliver it in 10 days, right at your doorstep, anything. Just draw a design. We're going to Delhi tomorrow. We're hosting a dinner. Uh, Mr. Singhani is hosting a dinner for 350 people, all the royal families of India. We have taken the family albums of royal families of Rajasthan and UP, and these are all royal families. They are family albums. And we have converted them into 3D printed gift items. So it's very, very pretty in terms of actual metal with this. So all the Maharajas are going to wear that specific thing there. So you can just get it done. You don't need a mold and all those old days are gone. That's changing the conventional thinking there. There's another point I want to make here. This is another example of how things can go very disruptive. We set up the largest worsted plant in the world, largest blended wool production plant in the world in 2005 to 8. Raymond set it up in Vapi. It's about 150 kilometers from here at an investment of 1,000 crores. That has, let's say, X output of fabric every year. There's a technology that we have come across in the last four years, three years, now we've started working with that thing, where, and this factory was set up, this is the actual picture of Wapi factory, which is 100 acre land, yeah? This is in Wapi, when you go, it's on the left side, when you drive towards Surat, you'll find that. We have a technology now, it's just one machine in 10 by 10, it's less than this space, it's half of this stage space, which can produce 50% of that output at 5% of the cost, $2 million. Can you imagine the cost of a jacket? This jacket, if it is 10,000 rupees, will become 500 rupees. It's close to demonetization. And if it's 500 rupees, why can't all of us wear it? Everybody can wear it. It's democratization of that. Yeah. This is where things can go. And this is obviously, currently it's a little ugly. And I tell you, this is not very ugly. I sent, when I got to know, this is a Manchester picture. This is a factory, this is a Jewish couple from Israel doing it in Manchester. They're already sending it to hospitals, so aprons and everything, functional dressing has already started. And this is the early years of digital photography. I would say this is the early 90s. And 2003, it was all disrupted. That's where it is. I send the head of my technology and head of my manufacturing, both of them. And both of them are like 55-year-old, hard-coded legacy, 40-year Raymond, 40-year industry experts who would be naysayers of these kind of technologies. Those people to Manchester, they went like 55-year-old, they came like 15-year-old kids. So excited and saying, Sanjay, if we don't really embrace this, we probably will be irrelevant in the next five years. We have to take this and we will better it because we know how to better it. Yeah? So it's like that kind of excitement some new technologies are giving us. 5% of cost. MOQ is one. So you don't need to make, for me, the minimum order quantity is 1,000 meter. Then I will put it in the loom and I will weave it and I will make a jacket for you. Here you can make one jacket. It was 3D printed. I can just put a design and it just comes out. Jacket for you is different. The lining can be different. It's just done to you. It's your face, your picture, your family's picture, whatever can be done there. And so on and so forth. App-based customization. This is what we have already, these are all commercial technologies in Raymond. The early stages, maybe two, five years away. But it's like design it yourself. So you put your collar, your shirt. You already seen some of the application. Bombay Shirt Company does a reasonably, reasonably okay job, I would say, but can get better. Uh, so some of these trials are happening. This is a thing that we've also launched here is shoe. The shoe that I'm making, uh, that currently I'm wearing, is actually done completely digitally. You just go there, you design, you play around with the kid, it's a 10 minute fun game, 50, whatever time you want to spend, every design becomes an archive, your design becomes an archive for the next person who walks into the machine to see it, and you can change shoelace to tip toe, to the sole, to anything you can change, play around with it, it gets done and given to you. So this is what is happening. Uh, across the personalized offers there, I'm not taking you through each of the innovation that we are doing, but this is another interesting one which we are currently working on, matter of time that we'll implement it. We are in the beta stage of testing this right now. So we base looking at a technology which if you just stand in front of a phone and take your selfie, equivalent of a selfie, a little more than selfie, but let's say take a selfie and two selfies, one straight face and one side, we should be able to tell your body measurement. Yeah. This is a technology which is, this is a Japanese uh, 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 application which got launched two, three years back. This is a US application and we are working uh, with the 
with Japanese and US people and we are also looking at Indian bodies and we are developing some things within Raymond also there. And if you do that, and which I believe will happen very soon, the whole measurement of bodies will go away. And that, what does that mean? That actually has very profound meaning in the world. All of us wear shirts and trousers of a certain size, at least the men are wearing. And we're not customized. We just pick up 38 size, 40 size, 42 size, whatever it is. My sense is in the next three years, sizing of clothes will be dead in the world. There won't be any size. There will be Sam size different and Vikram size different and Sanjay size. We may be wearing 42, both of us today, but Vikram's is actually 41.3 and Mayam may be 42.6. So why should we, he compromise, why should I compromise? He should wear his size, I should wear it. Plus he likes to put his initials on his cuff. So he should get his cuff link by his initials. He likes a button in a certain way, which should be done in that way. Why should he compromise and say 90% he can throw about shoulder and All this is gonna go away. Every single thing can get customized now. And that's what is happening. Two pictures and that's it. And we can get your body onto our, and once the body is in a bank, it totally changes how I can market it. I can actually do Swiggy on you, the way it was done. Saying you're not come and what happened and you know, you can really do the customer. This is really how you get measured. This was a little cumbersome way of doing it, but it's getting better. And uh, if, if these people have been doing it for donkey's year, it looks like ages. It's like all of us use Netflix. When we go, it's saying Sanjay, 98% match. Your thing, your favorites first. They may have a million things in the library, but you have shown only 20, which matter to you, including saying this is likely to work for you. This is a 90% match with your kind of a taste. They've been doing for a year. Why can't we do it? So I know exactly because clothing habits are very personal. We know exactly what jacket you buy, what kind of stuff you want. We, white shirt people buy white shirts in bulk. Some people, so if there is a new white shirt collection, why shouldn't I tell you this is a new white collection? So I can actually start recommending you wardrobes. So those kind of things there. Contact check checkout is already Part, part and parcel of the game there. So these are some technologies which are happening. But I want to leave you with this, is that these are the six specific pillars on which we are, in Raymond have taken it, and we are trying to see if there could be a disruption that we can bring to ourselves. Advisory, changing the whole model to rental. My sense is that rental is gonna come very, very quickly in India uh, from there. Customization, of course, which is digital customization, digital body measurements, 3D printing, and of course, sustainability, which you don't have any way out. The only point I want to read, leave out here is that because it is so crucial and it, it challenges conventional thinking and conventional profitability and business model, it's a very tough decision to take. And because it is a tough decision to take, it's best that we should not mix it with core business. So if you are business people here, you should keep it a little outside. Yeah? And the second mistake we normally make, this is again my learning here, is that in a large company, Legacy companies, we have a lot of advertising budgets, big budgets we have. And typically these startup kind of a thing, they are starved. So for us, it's saying, look, kudi kar le, panch kore advertising le lo. maybe advertising is a solution. Maybe das, do, log or dal lo. maybe additional resource is a solution, people. But that's the biggest mistake. Cash and investment is not shortcut to success. That's actually the worst way to success. Ideation is. And we tend to over-resource it because we are large companies. We should starve the edge. I may have 250 crores of advertising money for the conventional core business, but for here, I will make him pay for every penny. I must starve the edge. Otherwise, that's the second mistake we make. So that's another very important thing, and it must be. This is a very important thing. It has to be seen by the CEO and the owner of the company. Otherwise, it will not happen. Because normal people who are in the management will not take this decision. It's a very difficult decision to say, I'm challenging your conventional business model. Next year, 40% revenue down, 60% profit gone. Where is the money going to come from? It's not going to happen. Self-disruption means that. So here in your picture, if you see all the technologies, that's the VR technology, this is the 3D printing technology, this is Mr. Singhania, this is me. In some of the pictures there, that's the President Apparel there. Some of the digital technologies we're looking at, how do we don't? We're looking at virtual trial rooms. So you never have to go to a trial room. You just stand in front of a mirror and just keep doing this and the rest keeps doing. So taking away the trial rooms from our shops. And uh, this is another example, I was in Spain about in, in, in not very long back, I think uh, June or July uh, last year. And this is a shoe that I'm trying to make. This is a founder of a company. This is an iPhone. And all he does is he makes me put my feet on top of a paper, which I can do it sitting at home here, and just click a picture like that, one picture, and one picture like that. And it takes, it takes 10 seconds to take two pictures in an iPhone on a plain piece of paper with your feet. And a foot, every, every the shoe comes like, Perfectly fitted that you would not want the shoe out of your leg ever, for your feet ever. So beautifully done. 
because I don't know how many people really know, but 75% of humanity does not have two feet of the same size, but you wear the same size shoe. That's why every time you buy a shoe, that's the nature of leather or any shoe there. Yeah, you get your feet adjusts it. But why should you, should you compromise? This actually makes two shoes of different sizes, the actual size of your feet. You don't need to compromise. So that's the kind of technology. The last point I want to leave here is brand orbits. It's a very important thing for brand marketeers here that the conventional marketing models are passe or will soon become irrelevant. And this is the orbit really means ongoing relationships beyond individual transactions. Could we as brand custodians go beyond, have the shared purpose, and once we have a shared purpose, let's not worry about the business model. Let's go beyond individual transactions. And the whole point about there is that till now, till today, most of us, including me, have really built relationships to drive transactions. So we have CRM packages, loyalty programs, all these shopper stop loyalty, jet airways loyalty. So you're my customer, let me build a transaction. You're a premium customer, you're a platinum customer, you go there, I'll give you a lounge access, this, that. All that is building relationships to drive transactions so that I know, why should I get a free juice at a lounge? Because I'll take the next flight with jet or whatever airlines. That's why I'm given. But now the whole philosophy has to change to say embed transactions in relationships, not the other way around. This is a complete circle change. And what it really means is that you already have customers, that red dot is your customer of a brand, but there is a community, there is orbiters there. There are their friends, their families, their influencers, their communities in social media sitting. Now, if I know that Sam is a Raymond advocate, now he has a community, he has orbiters around him. How do I embed Raymond as a brand and purpose of my brand in his relationships? That's the new marketing philosophy which is coming. And every trillion dollar company which has reached understood and decoded this 10 years back. And they've been doing it beautifully by design. Look at Apple. Apple started with iPod and then got you to do Apple Pay. They put iTunes in that. They cut on the wall. They, they're putting now various other things there. They're just going and they're giving you the chargers which are there, everything which is within the ecosystem. They're embedding relationships and they're using orbiters to go there. So look at Amazon. From Kindle to Prime to Amazon.com, it really doesn't matter. What is the purpose? Amazon is not a book company, not a digital platform, not an e-commerce company. We are a platform. And in platform, you are a, and what is my purpose of the platform? You're the consumer and let's look at the relationships there. So that's what people have been doing. The value is going to shift. This is zero value today. Content, this is almost marginal value. Real value sits here. In, in fact, not even platform, now ecosystems, which is the next future of building businesses in the next decade will be ecosystems. Tesla has made more value in the last five years than GM has done in 120 years. Because, not because they've got a better car, not because it's electric, but it's a platform because it's an ecosystem, which is <laughs> the future. And so is G GM. GM has also started working in electric car, but it's a very different way. Geo, have you ever heard Mr. Mukesh Ambani ever say Geo is a telephone company or a mobile company? Not once. You see, Geo is a way of life. Geo is a platform. Geo commerce, Geo this, Geo content, Geo this, they're buying studios, they're buying this, because they retail and they're making access there. So that's a very different kind of, a, that's the platform. And that's why they're valued at what they are. They're saying that if Geo has an IPO today, the whole stock market, capital market will dry out. And that's why it may actually wait out because the whole money will suck in and there won't be any equity capital left in this country. Yeah? So we are also looking at some kind of an ecosystem as to how we can build. So we've been working at the back end, creating tailoring hubs, online tailoring, digital body measurements, clusters of khadis across the country. We have an outreach program to 100,000 tailors in the country, which we've reached about modest 30, 40,000. So we're not, we're far away from our target, but we're looking at some of these things that will come. These are the last two slides there. This has to be the future of brand. From actually asking your brand to say, what will I get if I use you? So this is what we want our customers to say. If I use your brand, what will I get out of this? That has to change. And it has to go to narrative from story. It will be, who will I be? Who will I be if I belong to your brand? So it's relationship with the purpose of the brand not the product. And if we can take our brands there, we'll have a huge, huge hit there. Yeah? So these are the three things I wanted to leave. And the big thing, the, the, the exciting part is, you and I have born into this world and getting into this decade where we've seen only 1% of disruption yet. It's going to double. One, two, four, eight. Again, that poll 26 times around the world is yet to happen. Because in the world, there are only 11 billion connected devices. 7 billion population, 11 billion. This 11 billion will become a trillion in, tech year, in 10 years. Trillion devices will be connected. 
trillion devices and 99% of sensors, digital is in the next 10 years. So from 11 billion to 1 trillion is 99%. So the pace of change, what you have seen in the last two years in two months will happen in two days from here on. Today was the slowest day on this planet. Let's accept it. Yeah, there wouldn't be ever a slower day than today now going forward. And that's the new global nervous system there. This is Jeff Bezos, again, one of the many idols I personally have, and I always end by either Jeff or Steve or somebody this, that I really get inspired by. But so beautifully put. This is the only reality. You have to keep evolving. And the greatest danger in time of turbulence is never the turbulence. It's to act with yesterday's logic or today's logic. It's not the turbulence. Turbulence we can manage. I think Swiggy is a great case study. I'm saying, how does it matter? 5%, 7%, 8%, 10%? I'm like, I'm like, but yesterday's logic is not that people will not eat food, they will not have money, we will figure a way out. And that's to act with yesterday's logic there. Thank you very much.